Hey guys, Ron here, and what you're about to see is practically a new series on the channel where I show you guys how to design a Pokemon. Considering every Pokemon type has different tropes and elements, I want to go through every Pokemon type and design new Pokemon based on the design trends of that type. Obviously, we're going to start with the grass type. In this video, we'll first go through the entire history of grass type designs and see how each generation interpreted grass type Pokemon. Grass types, like other Pokemon, have gone through drastic changes since generation 1, and we need to understand how real grass types look like before making our own. Then I'll design a few Pokemon based on the main design traits that we've discovered most grass types have. During that process, I'll actually go in depth into how to make a Fakemon design look like a real Pokemon. Keep in mind, I'm far from a master at this, I'm still learning too. But if you want to see a continuation of this series, please leave a like and subscribe. Consider also following me on Twitter where I post sneak peeks of these designs and even ask your help for almost every video I make. Now let's go back to 1996. I have just been born, and across the globe a bunch of Japanese kids are getting the pleasure of seeing the very first grass-type Pokemon in existence. Generation 1 grass type Pokemon are actually quite different from most grass types you see nowadays. Almost all of them are mysterious, mutated beings that kind of seem unhappy. Most of them are literal plant monsters, with only two families designed to be animals with plants attached to them. And even then, none of these animals are supposed to explicitly represent a specific real world animal, unlike all the other animal based grass types in other regions, which are clearly a goat or snake. In fact, I've noticed that these animals showcase the relationship between them and the plant that they utilize. Either it's parasitic or mutual symbiosis. Basically, all Gen 1 grass types start out as typically round and feeble, yet lethal creatures that evolve into dangerous monsters. A visual element I noticed is that all of the Gen 1 plants have spots and can incorporate some kind of bluish coloring, emphasizing their dangerous look. Gen 2 grass types are similar to Gen 1, since they're also mostly sentient plants. Only one family, the starters, are explicitly some kind of specific animal. But there's a huge difference in tone. While Gen 1 grass types are fearsome and represent the theme of genetics, Gen 2 grass types are cute and whimsical, which matches Johto's charm. There's also a stronger emphasis on pink and yellow. Almost all of them are still round too. Gen 3 continues the trend of most grass types being living plants, with only 4 of the 17 representing some kind of animal. And like in Gen 2, they're all dinosaurs or reptilians. Like in Gen 1, Gen 3 grass types seem dangerous, but without looking mutated. They all seem natural and cool. Most of the fully evolved forms have sharp appendages and showcase way more diverse patterns, considering the hardware update. Most importantly, almost all of them are tropical looking, with mythological inspirations, interesting concepts and origins. I've noticed that all of the plant-based monsters start off round, like in previous generations, but evolve into humanoid Pokemon. This becomes a trend in every single falling generation. The colors of Gen 3 grass types are generally green, red, and yellow, very warm to match the climate. Gen 4 is the beginning of a transition. There are relatively more animal-based grass types now, but a slight majority are still literal plants. It seems like this gen started the trend of some grass types having entire bushes or clumps of foliage, instead of only individual leaves. It also began the trend of properly showcasing forms. There's a good mixture of beautiful and dangerous looking mons, and a lot of them have lighter colors like cream or white to make them blend into Sinnoh's colder environment. So I think it's clear that in the first four generations, grass types are mostly plant-based creatures that started off with a darker theme, but ended up diversifying into a type filled with cute, cool, beautiful, and dangerous looking monsters. But this is all about to change. Cause Gen 5 was the first time we had more animal based grass types than living plants, and it's the first generation where most of these animals have very clear animal origins. It's also the beginning of a trend where grass types are either clearly masculine or clearly feminine, something that was touched upon in the previous generation. They're way less monstrous than the previous two generations, and they're way more green than ever. Gen 6 continues the trend of mostly animal based Pokemon, but considering Kalos is the first European based region, all of the grass types have a western feel to them, since half of them are ghost types, they're pretty hardcore. Brown and other natural hues are very prevalent, and it's the beginning of a trend where the grass types are tied to the specific locations they can be found in, like in urban settings or haunted forests. Gen 7 continues the trend of grass types displaying some kind of interaction with their environment or the player, either having a unique way of being encountered, or containing lore or design traits that flesh out the region itself. Most of them are plants again, they're less green and more tropical, no more bushes and basically all of them are either fickle, unassuming, or play tricks. I think the designers made an effort to design Alolan grass types in a way that subverts the tropes that were solidified in the previous two generations, so that these Pokemon seem foreign or strange, like animals you'd find in isolated islands. But Gen 8 goes back to mostly animals, with the least amount of sentient plants, 
only two. Each family is completely different from the last, with very different concepts. You have an animal with plants growing on their body, a sentient plant, an animal that lives inside of a fruit that ends up fusing with its home, and a mysterious half-plant, half-animal being. The consistent theme is less found in their designs, and more in their lore. They all benefit humanity in some way. So that is the complete history of grass type designs. They started off as mostly mysterious and dangerous plant creatures with the occasional animal plant hybrid and are now mostly benevolent animals with plant elements living alongside humanoid plant creatures. So we're going to take the most consistent trends and create two lines that embody the two most common types of grass type Pokemon. A two stage family of animals that have plant elements and then a round mysterious plant creature that evolves into a dangerous looking humanoid plant monster. For the first line, I'm going to base my animal themed grass type on a pygmy marmoset, the smallest monkey on earth. It's found in South American forests, is known for having greenish brown hair, it feeds on the gum that seeps out of trees, and they have very cooperative care groups. So our tiny pygmy marmoset will evolve into an adult version of itself that actually carries its pre-evolved baby on its back. It'll be very cute. I want to emphasize the decisions I made throughout the designing process that helped make the design feel more complete. Now while I want this Pokemon to be this tiny bean so its evolved form is more of a fully formed animal, I originally made its head and body somewhat separated, but I want to emphasize that this Pokemon is basically a ball, and when designing a Pokemon it's way better to simplify concepts like these. If I want this Pokemon to be a ball, I'll make it a ball instead of separating the head and body. So that's what I'm going to do. Originally I made this new version crawling, but this Pokemon jumps and grabs, so why not show that in the actual design? Again, especially when it comes to pre-evolved forms, we want to simplify as much as we can. So instead of individual arms and forearms, just another ball for the arms with a tinier ball for the hands. You want your prevos to consist of basic shapes, which you will flesh out as you design. You also want to make sure that there aren't any distractingly empty spaces. So for example, I gave it a pattern on its stomach, almost reminiscent of an arrow pointing upwards, because this Pokemon is always going up. Also, it's during this part of the process where you'll notice no part of this Pokemon is understated. If you're going to add something to a Pokemon, you can't make it too tiny or insignificant compared to all the other parts of the body. Pokemon aren't overly detailed, and when you have tiny parts, it makes it look complicated. So, for example, the tufts of hair that also look like leaves on this Pokemon aren't too small. They're clearly visible in clumps. The leaf-shaped patterns around its eyes are protruding outside of the body, but I'll change that in the final design. Again, we want to make sure the tail isn't too thin. We want every part of the Pokemon to look deliberate. Nothing should be an afterthought. If it has a prominent body part, like a monkey's tail, it should be noticeable. But it should never just be a straight up tail. You want to add a motif that matches the rest of the design. So a leaf shaped tail it is. Now here's the final design and colors. Cute animals have large foreheads, so making the face uh, smaller and lowering it a bit helps emphasize that. The colors are vibrant, but not too bright. In a different episode, we'll talk about the colors. I won't go in depth into how one achieves a Sugimori style official looking art, since everybody uses different programs and brushes. I use Photoshop to make art, but regardless of what you're using, there are just a few basic layers to finish Pokemon drawings. But a good Pokemon design is always good even before you move on to these next steps. So it's more important to master how to design a Pokemon before learning how to make the line art, the colors, the shadows, the secondary shadows, the highlights, and some added texture. Some designs have secondary highlights if they're extra shiny. I'll hopefully talk about these in detail in the next episode. Here is Marmini, the gripping Pokemon. This Pokemon can stick onto anything, but once it becomes independent from its parent, Marmini will jump around in search of gum that seeps out of trees. It loves all things sweet and is incredibly social. It will shoot sticky gum to immobilize foes and shrieks at high frequencies to call for backup. I love him. Let's move on to the evolved form. The whole point of this Pokemon is that it has a giant mane of leaves, and it carries its pre-evolved form like it's fused within its mane. I want to show how active and agile this Pokemon is, and again, we never want to make it look too complicated unless it's a super strong Pokemon. An average Pokemon like this is made of simpler shapes, like tubular arms and legs. Its face is a more angular version of its Prevo, whose tail is wrapped around its parent's waist. Now, a lot of design decisions I make have to do with general art rules, like strong silhouettes, which I won't go too in depth today. This is a Pokemon lesson, not an art lesson. I thought the space under its chin was too big and empty, so I added these leaves. Again, this is less about filling the design with uh, tons of details, and more about making sure that nothing looks empty. Here is Marmosen, the carrying Pokemon, a grass fighting type. Marmosen carry their children inside their bush-like mane until they're old enough to venture on their own. They will teach their young everything they know and even allow them to participate in battles alongside them. The more mature their child is, the more they can help out by watching for enemies and even shooting gumballs at any enemies chasing them. Their signature move, Gumball, does 75 damage and has a 30% chance of lowering the opponent's speed. 
They have the hidden ability Parental Bond, which allows the child to do an extra bit of damage each move. I think this is one of the most official looking Pokemon I've ever made, because I deliberately followed my own advice as I was making it. Compare these two to the original Marmosend I made almost 5 years ago, and you can tell the newer ones look way more like Pokemon. While the shape of the original ain't bad, it's just a straight up Marmoset. It has too much empty space and no distinguishable features or indications of any type or what evolutionary stage it's in. So this is a perfect example of how you can improve over a few years with the right guidance, and I still have way more room to grow. Now our second family will embody the grass type trope of a mysterious, round plant creature that evolves into a more humanoid monster. What's a mysterious plant or plant based object that doesn't have a Pokemon version yet? A tumbleweed. I'ma make a little tumbleweed guy that evolves into a grass ghost tumbleweed based on cowboys or general western tropes like Clint Eastwood's Man With No Name. You know, cause tumbleweeds are a western film trope. So we're basically making a round dude. I'm adding some dry leaves in the bottom to give it some contrast compared to the jagged branches on top. We're gonna break a lot of conventions with this family. It'll be pretty asymmetrical and have no green in sight, since it's a tumbleweed. Remember that modern Pokemon designs rarely have any sharp points. Even right angles and sharp leaves will be slightly smoothed. You don't want to make their hair too messy, it should still it should still be readable, you know? And you shouldn't just give a Pokemon legs without any significance, so throughout the design you'll notice them become more and more like a cowboy boots. Yellow and blue are somewhat complementary, and I added some brown to the tangled hair to make it look less like one homogeneous mass. I made the boots rectangular to match the branches, and here is Fantumble, the Vagabond Pokemon, a grass ghost type. Fantumble rolls around from place to place, stealing small belongings. Fantumble is constantly in search of objects that will bring it joy, though most rarely do. It never settles down in any location. It's so light that Fantumble is always at the wind's mercy. Even the wind that precedes impacts often knocks it away even before getting hit. Its tangled hair is made of dead branches that can often catch on fire in the driest of heat. This Pokemon's skin is abrasive and can cause endless itching if touched for more than a second. It has the abilities Frisk and Pickpocket with the hidden ability Filter. So now we're basically making a humanoid cowboy tumbleweed. It'll be less of a ball and more of a ghost made of jagged branches. I'm giving him a poncho made of the dry dead leaves on the bottom of its pre-evolved form, cause you always want elements of the pre-evolved Pokemon to be fully realized in the evolved form. The toughest challenge will be making the branches form the silhouette of a cowboy hat. I struggled for some time, but I prevailed. I even managed to make the bottom branches on its face look like a mustache. Notice how the sharp claws aren't too skinny. Its boots are formed by its bottom branches, but again, I'm not making too many crevices or tiny branches. They're all around the same thickness. It actually has ghostly legs underneath the large branch boots, which boosts its height. Always make sure that your humanoid Pokemon don't have the exact proportions of a human, so make parts like their head, hands, and feet relatively big like I did here. The body parts are also just basic shapes. The stomach is a circle and the arms are rectangles. And this is Fantwist. It deliberately goes from town to town in search of lost souls that it guides on their journey. This hollow Pokemon is driven to fill its empty body with acts of good, but Fantwist isn't above committing crimes in order to fulfill its virtuous goals. It can control dead plants and roots, allowing it to ensnare its victims. If it loses parts of its branchy exterior, it can create new exoskeleton from near dead plants. It's incredibly silent. Air and vibrations travel through its cracks, but at the right angle, this creates a whistle as it walks into town. There are so many more tips and tricks to making Pokemon designs that can only be showcased by different Pokemon types, body shapes, and origins, so please leave a like if you want part 2, where I make fire types, and subscribe if you haven't. Check out the previous Pokemon art video that I made, and go to the description for the t-shirts I made for you guys, my Patreon where you can get cool rewards like seeing my videos days early, which you can also do by pressing the join button. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram where I post previews of my art and completed pieces. Bye!